that title reading right now. Great. <laughs> Great. Well, uh, well, thanks to Pablo and to Joab and, and to Sid for inviting me. So it's a great pleasure to, to be here. Um, and so I'm really looking forward to the workshop. And, and like, uh, like uh, Joab and Pablo were saying, I think, think pulling together ideas from all these diverse fields is going to be a very exciting, uh, exciting uh, thing to do. Um, OK, so, so let me tell you a little bit about the work that we're doing in connecting networks broadly and start soft materials, uh, basically in, in, um, in assembly and folding of soft materials. Um, so let me just jump right in. And so tell you about some materials uh, assembly work that we've done in collaboration with, uh, with Steve Granick, uh, who until very recently was at Illinois, and he's now at, um, at an, heading up a new institute in Korea, which is very exciting. Um, so this is basically soft materials assembly. And so how can we understand soft materials assembly? And by understand, I really mean how can we pull out from data, whether that's simulation data or experimental data, the thermodynamics, the morphology, and the kinetics of the system. And so how can we get a handle on those things in some systematic manner? And so from data, whether you're watching experimental particle tracking trajectories or you're running simulations, it's still rather challenging to pull out the, the, the underlying mechanisms of assembly. And so doing things like visual inspection or perhaps uh, thermodynamic networks um, can give you some of the way, but really we tend to integrate over the microscopic details, and so we can miss the underlying collective kinetic motions that are really driving assembly. And so the question I would like to ask, um, how can we get these things? How can we get the thermodynamics, the kinetics, the morphology from, uh, from simulation or experimental data? Basically asking the question, what stable aggregates can form, so the thermodynamics, and how do they form? So this, what are the mechanisms? What are the kinetics? Um, and I'm going to try, try, and, um, try and put forward the, uh, the conjecture that assembly landscapes in the same way as protein folding landscapes can be a very useful way of thinking about this and sort of integrating um, these threads together in a unified framework. So the tool that we're going to use, let me briefly just spend a couple of minutes on, on the tool, and then I'll show you the, the applications that, that we're going to, going to deploy it towards. It's basically nonlinear dimensionality reduction. So, so the whole idea is that if you have a protein folding or you have some material self-assembling, they natively exist in a very high dimensional space. So if you have n particles or n atoms, if each of which has three coordinates, you have a three n dimensional phase space. And so maybe you have some very high dimensional space, but the idea is that within that space, potentially there exists a low dimensional structure, a low dimensional manifold. And so this is a manifest of the emergence of collective modes. So there's some slow modes to which the fast modes are slaved. So you can think about that in a temporal sense as a slow subspace. Or you can think about it geometrically simply as a low dimensional surface, so in this case a two dimensional Swiss roll in a three dimensional phase space. And so can we pull out this low dimensional surface, and typically the effective dimensionality is much less than the ambient, and that tells us something interesting about the system. It tells you your effective dimensionality, you perhaps only need a, a reduced uh, description of the system, and the order parameters parameterizing this low dimensional manifold are typically kinetically or mechanistically interpretable, and so you know something deep about the, the underlying dynamics of your system. Um, so it is an onslaught, so this manifold exists, and all the systems that we've studied it tends to exist, and so, so you're having cooperative couplings between degrees of freedom, and it's typically pretty low dimensional, two, three, four, five, six dimensional. Um, and so, so let me show you some, some examples of that. So how do we do this? There are multiple ways you could think about unrolling this manifold. And so if you were a linear manifold, potentially you could do something like multidimensional scaling or principal component. We expect highly convoluted manifolds just because the systems are... are of non-linear dimensionality reduction I'm going to use is the so-called diffusion map, so invented by Rafi Kaufman at Yale, the same chap who came up with wavelets. Um, there are other variants uh, you could use, sort of uh, locally linear embedding, um, ISO map if you're familiar with such techniques, any sort of non-linear dimensionality reduction technique will, will probably get you there. Uh, but let me tell you what, why I like the diffusion map. So the basic idea is that we have a, <coughs> excuse me, n observations in some high dimensional space, so m is very, very large, and we'd like to project that down into some, some, uh, some automated fashion our n observations to a lower k dimensional space, so attaining our dimensionality reduction. So how are we going to do this? So basically it's the Newtonian paradigm of, of integrating up local distances over a global manifold. And so we ask each point, how far are you from all of your neighbors? And this distance is a system dependent distance. If you're protein folding, maybe the RMSD is a good distance. If you're in some uh, simpler space, Euclidean might be good enough or reversible work or just a, a time um, as a proxy for distance. Uh, excuse me, root, root mean squared deviation. And so, so just the, the translational rotational optimal alignment of the protein. Do the following thing. So then we ask, can we convolute this with a Gaussian kernel of a particular bandwidth, which is saying nothing more than I'm going to throw the large distances and keep the small ones. So now you only see your nearest epsilon, which, which I... So now what have you done? 
So if you row normalize your, your A matrix, you have a Markov matrix. And so you can think about this as hopping in data space. And so it tells you how easy it is to hop from a particular data point to the nearest neighbor data points around space. So the first thing you do when you have a Markov matrix is you diagonalize it. And so you can find the leading eigenvectors and eigenvalues of this, uh, this Markov process. And you can think about this as, um, as basically finding the leading modes of a process. And so if you have infinite data, infinitesimally spaced, you can show that this operation actually reduces to solving a Fokker-Planck equation over the, the, the manifold. Um, and so by identifying the leading eigenvectors, or in the continuum limit, the leading eigenfunctions, you find the slow modes of your diffusion process. Um, so the, pro the procedure of the diffusion map is to identify these eigenvectors and then perform the following operation. You take your ith data point, so this is your ith observation of the system, the ith configuration of your protein or your material system, and you project it into the ith component of the top k non-trivial eigenvectors. So we throw away the first one because you're Markov and so you're the all ones eigenvector, so that's trivial. And so then you keep the top k non-trivial eigenvectors. Um, okay, so how do you know how many to keep? And so typically you look at the eigenvalue spectrum and uh, in all the systems that we study, you see a very pronounced spectral gap. And so there are a number of slow modes and then there are a number of fast modes. And so this is a temporal separation. You have a number of slow collective modes governing the system to which the fast modes are slaved as sort of an effective noise. And I'll talk about that again in a second. And so one of the really beautiful things that comes from this analysis, and this was all worked out by, by Rafi Kaufman, is that Euclidean distances in this embedding are equal to diffusion distances in your original space. So how hard it is to diffuse from one configuration to another in your original space is the equivalent to a Euclidean distance in your embedding. So how close you are in your embedding tells you how far away you are in your, in your real space. Um, and similarly, and I alluded to this, the, the eigenvectors are discrete approximations to the leading eigenfunctions of a, of a diffusion equation. And so you're really describing the slow dynamical motions of your system system and integrating over all, all the fast components. And so let me just uh, provide perhaps three interpretations. Number one, you can think about it in sort of the Maurice Wanzig sense, that basically you're decomposing your system dynamics into a slow and a fast subspace. So Maurice Wanzig says that this, this is possible for systems where you see separations of timescales. The fusion maps are telling you actually how to do the separation, so how you project into the right variables. How do you find the slow variables um, and, and the, the fast variables that you can integrate over? Um, there's also a very nice connection with, uh, with Jim Sethna from Cornell's idea of sloppiness. And so his idea was that the, there are sloppy and there are stiff directions governing your system. And so sloppy parameters are parameters that are collective variables that don't really have much of an effect on the system's behavior, whereas stiff collective variables have a strong effect on the system's behavior. And so really the diffusion map is trying to pull out for you the stiff variables, and then the sloppy ones are the ones that, that don't matter so much to the fast modes in a sense, um, or there's the sloppy modes in the, the sloppy sense, or perhaps they're the, the thin modes in a geometric sense. Um, and so I like this quote by, by Jim Seth, that if one needed to worry about every detail of the total theory to make a useful um, analysis, science would be impossible. And so sloppiness, i.e. emergent collective motions, are really what makes science possible by getting a massive simplification of your system. Um, and then a final interpretation, this maybe is more of an extension than an interpretation, is thinking about, because this workshop is connecting networks, is doing a connecting network partitioning. And so there's a very nice paper by Lafon and Lee, uh, which came out in 2006, which describes how, how to do this, but let me just briefly, briefly describe it. That if you embed your system in a, in a diffusion map embedding, you can then do some off-the-shelf clustering. So perhaps just k-means or something simpler like this, agglomerative hierarchical. And because you're clustering in this uh, sort of kinetically relevant space, if you do your clustering in that space, you can show that you're maximally preserving the spectral properties of your Markov walk. And so you're maximally preserving all of the kinetic properties of your system in the, in the optimal low dimensional formulation. And so, so there's a well-defined way to do that. Um, okay, so given I've, I've described the method to you, uh, let me just tell you a couple of applications. So, um, so up the top here, I'm showing you a computer because I'm first gonna show you and then I'm going to show you how we actually apply to, uh, to experimental data. And so the system we're, we're going to look at, so this is a, a nice uh, clean test system, and uh, the Glotzer group members here may recognize the systems. These particles were, uh, were designed by Sharon Glotzer. Um, there's also been some work at uh, Oxford and Cambridge by, uh, by Jonathan Doyle and Ard Louie on these particles. And so basically they're uh, Weeks Chandler Anderson soft spheres with sticky patches on them, which are Leonard Jones attractive and specific. And so green sticks to green and red sticks to red. And so you can decorate your, your spheres with two halos. And by the positioning of the halos, you can, you can try and infer, uh, infer what cluster you're going to make, whether those are octahedra, tetrahedra, icosahedra. Um, and these things are actually experimentally fabricable. And so our, our collaborator, Steve Granick, can actually make such things. Um, other folks, such as uh, um, women, can make, make such things at Michigan. And so it's a realistic system and a nice system for our methodology. 
Um, so we, we cooked up two particles, tetrahedral particle, or one that we thought would assemble tetrahedral, and one that we thought would assemble icosahedral, just by geometric um, arguments of where we placed the patches. And so let me tell you today what we did with the icosahedra. And so basically, we're running binding dynamic simulations. And so you have your channel Anderson and your specific Leonard Jones. Um, so these are all the simulation details. But basically, I'd just like you to note that we, we are sort of in uh, experiments. So T equals 1 in reduced units is 298 Kelvin. And uh, T star equals 1 is sort of 1.1 microseconds. So we're, so we're millisecond regimes at sort of lab temperatures. OK, so I told you that the, uh, the diffusion map requires you compute pairwise distances. If you're a protein, the RMSD is a pretty good choice. If you're a clustering, uh, and I particles, your problem. So the first problem you have is particle fungibility. So there are n factorial ways of relabeling these particles without changing the state of the system. Um, so there's a combinatorial explosion in the number of ways you can label. Um, secondly, there's no natural basis set to express configurational similarities. So you're rotating and translating through space. And so how do you define that this cluster containing one, two, three, four, five, six particles, how similar is it to this one containing four? Um, and similarly, how is this one uh, compared to this guy once you've sort of collapsed down and into this, this sort of uh, liquid-like blob? So it's very difficult to define real space. What we're going to suggest is that perhaps you can define distances in an abstracted space. So we're going to run our molecular dynamics, or, excuse me, our Brownian dynamic simulation. We're going to extract all the clusters just based on pairwise proximities, so pairwise distances. And so that gives us all of our clusters. And we can have a nice graph representation of all the clusters we've seen. And this provides a clean way to measure graph similarities. And so basically, we can take um, the axes are, in this case, just indexing over the particle number. And so when you see a blue dot, that means that these two particles are within a certain threshold distance. And so they're interacting. And so they're forming part of the same cluster. Um, yeah, so it's just a means to, to extract our, our clusters. Yeah. Clusters of particles, precisely. That's right. So we, we're populating the phase space based on clusters. So we're saying, what clusters do we see? Those are the, those are the phase space. That's right. So alternatively, you could define it over the full 3N dimensions. Uh, we were experimenting that, but we're sort of data starved. And so we're making the jump that we can just describe things in terms of clusters. Um, so it's just a pairwise, if you have a large enough threshold, precisely. So, so we, we showed that we were robust to our choice, but it's basically, if you take the Leonard Jones well depth between two sticky, sticky patches um, over a large range, sort of within plus or minus 50% of that well depth, if we use that as our threshold, we get the same, we get the same clusters. So it's just proximity of the sticky spheres. Um, but you're right. So if you had, for example, this one forms an isolated cluster because you're all facing inwards with your sticky patches. But you could also think about the, then this guy bonding on an hierarchical fashion to, to other clusters. So you could have two land scales potentially in the problem. For now, we've just taken a simple approach of how close your sticky spheres are. Exactly. If they're bonded, why are you calling them two different clusters? What is it? Right? Um, um, so I think what I'm is that if, if two particles are close enough that they are within the same well, then it jumps well. You say, OK, they are part of the same cluster. Right. That's exactly right. You can think of it like that. That's right. Are you looking at the patches or like the center? The patches. So the sticky patches, the surface patches. Um, OK, so given that we can decompose into a bunch of clusters and represent them as graphs, we can then do graph matching. Um, and so we can extract the graph corresponding to this cluster, the graph corresponding to this cluster, and basically use a greedy algorithm to find the optimal, arrange, uh, optimal permutation of going from this graph to this graph. Um, and then we can find the optimal Frobenius distance between them. Um, so this is a greedy algorithm, so we're not guaranteed to converge to the optimum. For small clusters, we show that we typically do. Um, and this is based on an adaptation of the ISA rank algorithm by, uh, by uh, Bonnie Berger from, uh, from MIT. And so basically, you can think about this in physical terms as how much um, remodeling do I have to do off my graph to go It's a pairwise distance. So we can feed this pairwise distance to the diffusion map, do precisely the, the protocol I described. And I'm going to show you the two-dimensional embedding that, that comes out. And so two axes 
axes are the diffusion map leading eigenvectors, and so um, eigenvector 2 and eigenvector 3. And I'm going to parameterize by temperature. So very high temperature, you see basically no aggregation. So you just see small clusters form, as you would expect. As you lower the temperature, you open up an assembly pathway to form the terminal icosahedra along this route right here, which is basically monomeric addition. And so this is the simplest, simplest thing you could think of. What happens is you reduce temperature, something interesting happens. You open up a parallel assembly pathway through this, uh, this disordered liquid. And the system falls into a very um, sort of um, disordered entropic liquid, so everything's sort of condensed together. And then periodically, perfect icosahedra bud off from this liquid. As you lower further, you tend to favor the liquid pathway over the monomeric addition pathway. And by scanning over temperature, you can analyze the, um, the, the activity of each pathway, so how much flux is flowing through each pathway. So as a function of temperature, your monomeric addition pathway decreases as you reduce your temperature, and your bud budding pathway increases. And you can optimize your, your, your yield. And so how quickly you assemble things as a function of temperature, it turns out is about right here, uh, where you're mainly monomeric addition, but you have some budding character. Precisely, that's right. So you go from a monomer to a dimer to a trimer to a tetramer, all the way to icosahedra. Um, so what we've actually been able to do is we, we've taken a, a sort of a simulation data set that's sort of very difficult to analyze just by visual inspection or sort of proxy metrics of tracking. And by embedding it into a low dimensional space, we've managed to pull out the morphology, pull out the thermodynamics. And this is a non-equilibrium system. Um, so so we, we don't have equilibrium kinetics, but certainly we have um, rates of assembly. So how quickly you can assemble things as a function of temperature. So this is the first stage towards design because you can think about temperature as being the attractiveness of your patches. Um, and so this is the attractiveness of your patches that maximizes your, your assembly flux. The stage we're taking this towards is how do you optimize your geometry? And so how do you change your patches or change the, uh, the architecture of your particle to form different aggregates or form aggregates more quickly? So I'd like to move on now to um, an experimental analysis, since this is the collaboration we, we had with Steve Granick. And so when we're working on this, uh, this first piece of work, we, ha we had the, the realization that all we're really doing is taking molecular dynamics or Brownian dynamics simulation trajectories, which are particle coordinates as a function of time. So folks who do particle tracking for a living have exactly the same data sets, particle coordinates as a function of time. So why not apply this to experimental data? Um, so I'm trying to show this by the beaker up in the top here, or the, the flask. And so the system we're, we're looking at, uh, and so this was done by Steve Granick and his student Jia Zhang, are Janus particles. And so you have silica particles coated on one hemisphere by uh, titanium dioxide uh, coating. And you put those particles in two dimensions in an oscillating electric uh, AC electric field. And this induces two things to happen. Number one, you get induced dipole-dipole attractions. So you have oscillating dipoles in the two hemispheres, causing anisotropic attractions. And you also induce a hydrodynamic flow over the surface of the particles, causing them to become self-propelled. And so if you watch some, uh, some microscopy movies off these particles, um, you, you can see them sort of moving around and self-assembling. And so this is the active passive case where you have Janus particles and pure silica particles. So the silica ones are going to form sort of these hubs. They do not move under the field. And the Janus particles are going to stick on top of them. And then when you only have active, you form these sort of snakes and loops. And so if I play the movies, you can see guys moving around in real time. Um, these ones are forming these pinwheels. Um, and when you, when you remove the passive particles, the templating of these pinwheels, you just have snakes um, and chains. And so again, you have very complicated high dimensional dynamics. And so we were asking, well, well can you understand this in a lower dimensional assembly manifold? Um, so if you, you run precisely the same algorithm I, I just described, but now we have experimental data, we, we find the following. So up in the top left, this is indicating this is the active and passive system. And so so two collective modes emerge. Um, and so I'm coloring each one of these projected snapshots, each one is a cluster observed in the experiments, onto a two-dimensional manifold. And I'm coloring by the average path length. So basically, how, how far on average is your nearest neighbor? So if this is very far, it means that you're sort of rarefied and you have a long way to walk. Whereas if it's very small, so if you're dark blue, you're very compact. And so we see that starting from the monomers down in this uh, lower left corner here, there are basically three routes you can assemble along. And so you can go to these compact clusters, these archipelagos, or these spinning pinwheels. And so what's very nice about this, uh, this quantitative description is you can show, number one, how the assembly landscape changes as a function of experimental conditions. So let me show you here at a particular electric field strength, at low frequency AC field and high frequency AC field, how the manifold changes. And so basically what's happening is the particles are moving faster, so you disfavor the large aggregates around the outside, and you can quantify how your assembly landscape is changed as a function of experimental conditions. You can also just collect histograms over these things and uh, take, a, take a negative logarithm of the probability to make an effective free energy landscape. So it's a 
perspective because we are out of equilibrium. This is a non-equilibrium system. We're driving with a field. Uh, but you can think about this as just a convenient representation of the probability you reside at each particular cluster architecture. And so what we find is a low free energy assembly path going from your monomers to your pinwheels. And it's less favorable under this pathway to go to these, uh, these disordered clusters and these archipelagos. And then at elevated frequency, you disfavor this pathway and you reside mainly in the monomeric state. And so these percentages are the fraction of your system mass living in each one of these quadrants. Um, and so again, this provides a, a nice quantitative way of interpreting your complicated experimental data in a very low dimensional intuitive manner. So if I move on to the, the purely active system, so where you don't have any templating by the passive linker particles, you find a different landscape. So again, it turns out it's two dimensional. Um, the landscape's a little bit simpler this time. Basically, you just have a single backbone taking you from your monomers all the way to your assembled chains. And then motions orthogonal to, this, to this, uh, this backbone tell you about the complexity of your architecture. So if you're bang on this backbone, you're basically a chain. As you move outward, you explore more complicated uh, structures such as rings and stars. Um, and the manifold is, is actually very useful also in interpreting your data. And so local motions over this manifold correspond to small scale structural events, whereas large scale events correspond to non-local non tunneling over your manifold. And so let me illustrate this with this particular example. So we started from this 12 mer chain, which is just about to bite its own tail. So if you ever played a uh, snake on one of the old Nokia phones, you're just about to lose right here. So you're about to bite your tail. Um, so that corresponds to this point right here on the manifold. It then bites its own tail and forms a ring and a chain. And so the sigma ring and the sigma chain. So at this point here, you have this local motion over the manifold, and then you tunnel when you actually separate into your ring and your chain, into these two simpler architectures over here. So it provides a, a convenient way of representing the structural events that you see in your, in your experimental trajectories. So you can also think about using this to try and uh, understand, interpolate, and extrapolate how your experimental conditions are going to affect your, um, affect your, uh, your assembly. And so at low frequencies, intermediate frequencies and high frequencies, low electric field, intermediate electric field, and high electric field, you can change how much of the manifold you explore. And so you can change your experimental control variables to determine what your assembly landscape is going to look like. You can also quantify this by, by just uh, aggregating how much of your mass resides in each little, um, little cell of your, uh, of your landscape. Um, so I've just collected in these, these, uh, these uh, little portions of the manifold over here, one, two, three, four, five, and six, the fraction of the mass that resides in each one of those, those uh, regions as a function of your conditions, your frequency and your electric field strength. And so you can now think about this to, to try and do design. So imagine you wanted to maximize the amount of mass that lived in region three, so intermediate length chains. So that would tell you that, that you want to live at high frequency and intermediate uh, electric field strength. So right here, if you wanted to maximize until the selectivity of region three, you might live somewhere else because you want to disfavor other architectures. And so this can interpolate your data, but can also extrapolate. So it might tell you, well, maybe you want to go further. Uh, maybe you want to go to higher and higher frequencies in order to, to maximize your yield. So providing a, an interpretive way to sort of guide future experimentation. So that's all I'd like to tell you about assembly. And so maybe I can switch gears and tell you a little bit about applying similar techniques to, to folding. And so in this case, uh, protein folding. So I'm going to call it protein folding. We're actually going to look at an alkane chain. But let me tell you why that's OK. Um, OK, so, so, so what we're really interested in is the, the canonical idea of folding landscapes. So I told you about assembly landscapes. And so of course, if you have a single molecule, now you have the, the, the classic folding landscape. So, so going back to Ken Dills, Anne Luthi Shilton, uh, Peter Wellness, thinking about protein moving over a free energy landscape or a potential energy landscape going from a, a, an unfolded structure down to its native state. And so we have the free energy, and the free energy is related to, to the probability. So if you have a molecular simulation uh, or uh, Yep, so if you have molecular simulation, so you're moving over your free energy landscape according to Newton's equations of motion, and assuming ergodicity, which, okay, is a big assumption, but the trajectory is an equilibrium ensemble of states. And so if you pick a very simple molecule, such as a hydrocarbon, maybe you can assume that you're pretty ergodic. And so, so in this case, we've shown that that is true. So this is a, just a short 16 uh, more alkane chain. And so if you think about collecting data over your assembly landscape, you can your underlying assembly landscape is, basically by doing the diffusion map uh, protocol that I just described. Um, and so to do that, you collect a long simulation trajectory, um, and then you run the diffusion map. In this case, we're using RMSDs to measure pairwise distances. You project down. It turns out you have a three-dimensional manifold. Um, and so you have the all-trans chain is li living in this global free energy minimum right here. And then you have these two folding pathways that take you along the top and the bottom of this manifold down to this coiled helical state out here. And so this is colored by the free energy. So this is very low free energy here. Then there's a few kT of a free energy barrier by which you sort of make a kink in your chain. You then slip down and then you coil up. 
And so what's not immediately apparent here is you also have, a, have two wings which are coming out at very high free energy corresponding to the right-handed helix and the left-handed helix. And so this is a folding landscape for a hydrocarbon chain. So, okay, so maybe you can think about this if you squint your eyes as sort of a canonical prototypical model for hydrophobicity. We wanted just a nice clean test system, but we're currently applying similar things to, to proteins. Um, but let me tell you one of the things that's nice about the alkene chain is because it's so clean, we can actually symmetrize this landscape. So what I'm going to tell you about is trying to extract this landscape from experimental data. And experimental data has one issue with the symmetry of the chain, that it can't distinguish the head from the tail or a left-handed helix from a right-handed helix. And so I'm basically going to appeal to FRAT data, which just gives you a distance. And so this distance can't give you the symmetries. And so I'm going to artificially symmetrize this landscape that I got from knowing the coordinates of all atoms of the molecule by symmetrizing over the head-to-tail symmetry and the mirror symmetry, i.e. the molecular chirality. So if you do that, basically what I've done is just fold the landscape twice. And so I folded it this way because I can't distinguish whether I'm head to tail or tail to head. And I folded it this way because I can't distinguish whether I'm a left-handed helix or a right-handed helix. So in the previous part of your talk, the states were topologically defined. Exactly. So in this case, uh, to machine precision, yes, there every, every, it's a configurational specification. So it's, everything is a dis distinct configurational state. So we do subsample over that. We, we sort of have, have too much data to handle with this, this algorithm. But, but yes, that's right. So they're, they're defined by their atomic coordinates in this case. And then pairwise distances are by the optimal rotational translational alignment, which gives you the RMSD. <clears throat> Um, okay, so this is, this is me just folding the landscape, and it turns out that if you remove these two symmetries, you basically have a two-dimensional manifold. So this is, this is basically has infinitesimal thickness, which allows me to project this into two dimensions and show on the z-axis the, the topography or the topology of the free energy. And so these are my two order parameters given to me by my diffusion maps applied to all atom data, removing the symmetries, and the z-axis is the free energy just by collecting histograms. So your all trans state is here, then you have your folding pathway, which takes you up to your folded um, helix um, right up here. So this is gonna be my target. So, so this, is, this is what I would like to find from experimental data. So can we find such a landscape knowing only something that you can attain from experiment. So the particular experimental data set I'm going to appeal to is, is, uh, is in a hypothetical sense, is FRET data. And so FRET is a fluorescence resonance energy transfer. So basically you functionalize your, your molecule of interest with two fluorescent probes. One absorbs light at a particular wavelength and emits at a particular wavelength. But if these get with insufficient proximity, there's a Forster resonance energy transfer from the absorbing fluorescence uh, group to the, to the, um, to, to the, in this case, the yellow one, which emits at a separate wavelength. So by measuring the, uh, the intensity of the emitted light, um, given uh, that you irradiate with this wavelength of light, you can discern how far apart these probes are. So I'm integrating over, over masses of experimental uh, difficulties that go into this, but in principle, one can obtain a frat trace like this. So at low intensities, these probes are far away. At high intensities, they're, they're close together. And this perhaps then allows you to say, well, how close are these probes? And so you now have a one-dimensional measurement about some coarse-grained observable of your system, for instance, a head-to-tail distance. So that's what experimental, experimental data can give you. Now, if you knew your free energy landscape, you knew your underlying folding landscape, you could run simulations over that folding landscape and predict what your fret efficiency would look like. So that, that, that's an easy thing to do. The question I'm asking is the inverse problem. So giving this fret data, a univariate time series, can I infer some free energy landscape? So can I recover the, the multidimensional free energy landscape that I showed you a few slides ago? And so, in other words, can I, can I infer something about the geometry and the topology of the folding funnel, knowing only the of a single coarse-grained observable. So is this possible? So I'm going to show you that I cannot get the complete folding funnel, but I can get something that's very close to it, actually something that's related by a smooth transformation. And so this all rests on, a, on something called Takin's embedding theorem. And so this is, a, this is a theorem back from the 80s uh, by a Dutch mathematician, Floris Takin's. And so he was involved in the early days of chaos theory, dynamical systems theory. And so I've sort of expressed the theorem in three boxes on the left. You don't have to read them if you don't want. Let me explain it to you on, on the right-hand side here. So what we have is a protein moving, or in this case an alkane chain moving, in some configurational space. It doesn't explore the full space S, explores a, small, a, a lower dimensional manifold, and the trajectory of the protein as it folds and unfolds moves over this manifold. So this was what I recovered a few slides ago. This was the, the folding landscape for the alkane chain. Now imagine we can only measure a single univariate observable V, and so this is our measurement process. This is an R1, and so it gives you a time series of the evolution of a coarse-grained observable. Okay, so, so that, that was our FRAT trace. And following operation, you take your coarse-grained observable and you make a so-called delay 
embedding. And so you take the value of your observable, your head-to-tail distance at a particular time t, and then you match it with the head-to-tail distance at t minus tau, t minus 2 tau, t minus 3 tau, all the way to t minus 2 n tau. You've constructed a 2 n plus 1 dimensional space from your one dimensional time series. You've exploded it into this very high dimensional space. Um, okay, so what's the utility of that? Well, the utility is that Tarkin's theorem states that the manner in which the system evolves over this um, hypothetical space you've constructed, this delay space, is very closely related to the way the system evolves in a dynamical sense over the real space. Smooth and invertible transformation. And so I say that the free energy landscape you would get by analyzing your delay dynamics is, is a diffeomorphism from the free energy landscape you would get from analyzing the, the true dynamics, if you knew all the atomic coordinates as a function of time. And so you have this invertible transformation, which is also smooth and differentiable, so you get a diffeomorphism taking you from one to the other. Um, okay, so, so given that the theory states that, can we, can we put this into practice? So, so what, what am I going to do? So I'm by no means an experimentalist, and so we take our simulation of our alkane chain, and then we pretend the only thing we know about it is its head-to-tail distance. And so, so I close my eyes and say the only thing I know is a head-to-tail distance as a function of time. Um, and I can then analyze this time series using Tarkin's theorem. I can make my delay embeddings, project into this horribly high dimensional space, and then I can run exactly the same trick as I did before in my atomistic space, which is to see if there's a low dimensional manifold living in that high dimensional delay space, pull it out, collect a free energy landscape, and that free energy landscape should be a smooth transformation of the original folding funnel. Um, so let me show you, show you our results, and so this is by doing precisely that procedure. Um, and so you can see we get two collective variables pulled out of the delay space. You get the free energy of your landscape. And I'm projecting onto this, so of course you wouldn't know this if all you had was a, was a single univariate time series, but of course we have the underlying atom simulation trajectory. And so the points corresponding to, to the low free energy well here are the uh, trans configurations, exactly as we saw before. You have a folding pathway which takes you up to your helices up here, um, and you, you've removed the two symmetries automatically by the fact that this head-to-tail distance can't, can't distinguish them. And so we believe that we've hit the target, and so we think we've shown that from a univariate time series we can find a multidimensional folding funnel. Um, and so it remains for me to, to prove to you that these really are diffeomorphic. So if I can jump back, if I can find my cursor. Uh, so this was the original landscape we got from knowing all atomic coordinates of the molecule at all times. Um, and this is the free energy landscape we got from just knowing the head-to-tail distance and applying Tarkin's theorem plus, plus diffusion maps. Um, so if they really are diffeomorphisms, you should find that the, uh, the transformation is, is uh, invertible, smooth, and differentiable, which, uh, which you can show by proving that the Jacobian of the transformation from one landscape to the other should be single-signed. And so that's exactly what we see. So if you, if you compute the Jacobian going from one landscape to the other, it does remain single-signed. It does not, however, remain single-valued. And so the magnitude of the Jacobian is changing, which means the amount of stretching and squeezing you're doing at each point in the landscape is a little bit different. However, we have shown that they are truly um, invertible transformations because you've not torn or stitched together your manifold. It is a smooth transformation. So to summarize, um, I'm claiming that you can go from all atom simulation data, knowing all the atomic coordinates as a function of time, through diffusion maps to finding the folding, the folding funnel and some emergent collective variables. If the only thing you know about your system is a single coarse-grained observable, and there are some conditions on that, which, which I haven't discussed, um, and you apply Tarkin's theorem and diffusion maps, you can find a, a folding landscape which is related by a smooth transformation. Um, okay, so these are in three dimensions. I can project down into two dimensions and show you in a contour plot, which may be a little bit clearer. And so this has just been stretched and squeezed to form this landscape right here. So there's not been any tearing or stitching together of the landscape. So the idea is, perhaps, that we can now integrate this with, with pure experiment. And so given that you only have FRET data, such as uh, folks like uh, Tikjeep Ha, who was very recently, until very recently at Illinois, um, you can apply Tigan's theorem and diffusion maps and find a, a folding landscape. And you know that that's a smooth uh, transformation to get the true folding landscape. So OK, so this is the big problem is, the elephant in the room, you don't know the, folding, the, the transformation function. And so this is where I think simulation can come in and try. And you can do, perhaps, short simulations to try and figure out what this, uh, this transformation is and then invert this landscape, potentially. Um, so that's a long ways off. But, but, it, but we think it's a, an interesting thing to be able to take experimental data and find something that's very closely related to your true underlying protein folding funnel. Um, so with that, I'd just like to thank the, uh, the folks who did the work and the, uh, the funding sources. And so the first part of the work on the uh, machine learning of self-assembly was done by Andrew Long, who's this chap here. The second part was done by Jiang Wang, who's this chap here, and uh, our collaborators, Steve Granick and his graduate student, Jia Zhang. Um, and then just, uh, just funding sources for, for the, the various uh, projects in the lab. So thanks very much for your attention. Um,
first thing you should the assembly clusters. Uh, you know that the reaction coordinates you got are good ones. Like we've done commuter analysis and things like that. Yes, that's a great question.